We're trying to pack a lot into today, so um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. And I appreciate everyone making it through the maze of construction outside. We have a hardy group here that uh, navigated through that, so I appreciate you all being here. Uh, my name is Laureen Tooze Harbert. I'm the program director for the AIDS Funding Collaborative. And like I said, we're just thrilled to have an auditorium full of folks who are coming to HIV from different perspectives, but who share a desire to engage in conversation about how to reduce the number of new infections and ensure the health and well-being of those in our community living with HIV and AIDS. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about um, this forum and our goals, the idea of this forum has actually been percolating for some time. Uh, Julie Patterson came back from a conference in uh, Boston at the beginning of the year uh, with speaking very highly of Ron Stahl, who's with us today. She was really struck by his research and the way he frames the data um, and thought that it would be um, a good idea to invite him to Cleveland to share his thoughts and his perspective. Um, then sometime later, David Merriman emailed me uh, the transcript of an interview that Ron gave, um, and we both got energized again about the concepts that he discussed. Um, Janet McGrath, who sits on the AIDS Funding Collaborative, knows Ron through the anthropology and sociology community. And so in June, we finally all just got together and started um, planning and conceptualizing this forum. Uh, and we wanted to invite Ron Stahl to come and present topics of community viral load and an HIV prevention cocktail, and then have a community dialogue about how we might apply those concepts to the way we think about HIV prevention and care and hopefully think in a more integrated way in our community using, the, using that framework. So that has led us to today. Uh, so our goals in planning this forum were to start a dialogue in our community about the concepts of community viral load and an HIV prevention cocktail and then use these frameworks to bridge the gap between the behavioral and the medical approaches to prevention and between the prevention and the care silos in our community. So I wanted to just thank a few folks before we get started, certainly the planning committee um, of David Merriman, Bob Bucklew, Janet McGrath, Julie Patterson, and David Bruckman, who really helped us conceptualize and plan for this day. Certainly want to thank all of our panelists and our speakers um, and our moderator, who you'll meet all here in, in the next little while. Bob Bucklew from the AIDS Clinical Trials Unit here has been instrumental in planning the logistics here on campus. He's actually en route to South Africa today, but I want to make sure to mention him for hosting us here. There are many co-sponsors of this forum, and they're all listed on the agenda. Um, and we really appreciate all of those co-sponsors in helping us get out the word about um, this forum. And clearly, by the range of people that are here today, they really outdid themselves in, in um, spreading the word and, and getting people here. And I also especially want to thank the Association of Nurses and AIDS Care, who are providing uh, CE accreditation for this forum. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, I hope that you all got a, um, packets when you walked in that have some materials. Um, that includes the agenda. There's a copy of Ron Stahl's slides in the packet. Um, we don't have um, David Bruckman's slides, although there's a one-page handout that will be circulating. And his slides will be posted on clevelandhealth.info um, because they're public record. So you can go to clevelandhealth.info for those slides. Um, there's an article that Ron wrote to um, note the 25th anniversary um, of the AIDS epidemic. And there's also an evaluation form. We certainly hope you'll fill that out and let us know what you think of this um, forum. And it's also required if you want to get a CE certificate uh, or a certificate of attendance for your licensure body, um, fill out that evaluation form and bring it outside at the end of the forum um, so that you can um, get your certificates of attendance. Uh, it does catch some people by surprise that there's information, there's questions on the evaluation form about race and income and eth ethnicity, and that's required by one of our funders, so that's why it's there. <laughs> 
Um, so let me just go through the flow of today's uh, presentation. We're going to hear presentations first by David Bruckman and by Ron Stahl. David will be speaking about the trends we're seeing in HIV AIDS in our community. And Ron will be pre presenting the concept of community viral load and how that feeds into a framework of HIV treatment as a means of prevention of new infections and also the notion of an HIV prevention cocktail. Um, then following their presentations, we have four panelists who will just give brief remarks um, from, di from their different perspectives and professional roles in the community about the concepts that we're going to hear about. And then um, following that, we, we've planned for 45 minutes or so of dialogue and community participation to really hear some responses about these concepts and thoughts about how we can apply these concepts in our community. Um, and Philip Morris from The Plain Dealer will be moderating that part of today's uh, presentation. We should wrap up by 3 o'clock, but we'll have refreshments outside um, and time to continue informal conversation outside and have some refreshments at, at 3 o'clock. Um, you can also get your parking tickets validated out there if you didn't on the way in, so um, look for the registration table if you need that. And this forum is also being recorded, so we'll have DVDs and it will be posted on the YouTube site for Case, Uni Case Western U Reserve University. Today. Um, so I just I ask that you turn off your cell phones or put them on vibrate um, and I'll move into um, introducing our speakers and I could spend a lot of time giving you David Bruckman's and Ron Stahl's credentials but I'm sure you want to hear them speak more but just to suffice it to say that David Bruckman is an enormous resource in our community through his work as a biostatistician at the Cleveland Department of Public Health because of David, we have some of the best local data about HIV AIDS as any community. Um, and he's also an adjunct, adjunct instructor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics here at Case. Um, he has another commitment later on this afternoon, so he'll be sneaking out a little bit early. Um, but we appreciate him being here and sharing hot off the presses data about HIV AIDS um, in our community. Ron Stahl is currently professor and chair in the Department of Behavioral and Community Health Sciences in the Graduate School of Public Health at the uh, University of Pittsburgh. He began work in 1984 on the AIDS Behavioral Research Project, which is one of the first longitudinal longitudinal studies of AIDS risk-taking behaviors in the world and he has published 120 scientific papers about the AIDS epidemic. Uh, his central research interest is the study of how social and cultural forces shape the behaviors that place individuals at higher risk for disease outcomes. And while, while he has particular expertise in HIV AIDS among gay men, and you'll hear quite a bit of that um, research about gay men in his talk, the concepts he will cover apply to other marginalized populations and communities. And we'll introduce our panelists and moderator after uh, the presentations by David and Ron. So I'll turn it over to you, David. I do want to give you some background um, and while I pour my own prevention cocktail. Uh, <laughs> let's go ahead and get started. So today we're going to be covering uh, the new HIV data, surveillance data for Cleveland. And let me know if you can't hear me at all. I'll make sure to speak loud. Uh, okay, let's see. All right, well, we're just going to have to go the old fashioned way. What you'll find, uh, you'll always find our surveillance and updated data reports, including information on communicable disease, at our website for, our, uh, for the Cleveland Department of Public Health, clevelandhealth.org. Um, and we also have a, a sister site, which is a collaboration project of the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics here at Case, as well as the Cuyahoga County Board of Health uh, and the Cleveland uh, Perinatal, the Regional Perinatal Network and clevelandhealth.info is really a portal where you can find uh, links or even information uh, covering a whole multitude of health information. The best way to navigate is really to either put a word into that search field or click keywords. 
and you'll find a list. All of our items, whether they be links or documents, have a keyword listed to them or several keywords and you should be able to find uh, information there. So for, for those of you who are not familiar with Cleveland and where it sits, um, and I, I never assume that because I do teach medical students, many of whom are not from the area. Um, you can see Cleveland rests within Cuyahoga County here in the, um, you can see the, the in red, the, the border of Cleveland. There are actually 59 municipalities within Cuyahoga County, and in fact there are 36 statistical planning areas or neighborhoods within Cleveland. I know they're a little hard to read. I may refer to a few of them from time to time, um, but I'll make sure to give you at least some reference to where they are. So a little bit of background on Cleveland and Cuyahoga County. Uh, this map shows the, the population density of African Americans based on the 2000 U.S. Census. And the, the county is quite segregated. Uh, you can see that the majority of African Americans live on the east side of Cleveland and into the, um, into the inner edge of the county. In fact, the areas in the dark, uh, highlighted by uh, these darker areas, have between 81 and 96 percent African American. Conversely, the um, Latino or Hispanic population is centered primarily in the center of the city, uh, extending out to Riverside and into Lakewood and to the western edge of Cleveland. But you can see that um, there is quite a bit of diffusion both ways. Accepting the award. <laughs> so, oh, thank you. So just to give you some background on our reporting, um, communicable disease reporting is mandated by state law. And our office is the central reporting office for HIV and AIDS diagnoses for the county. Uh, we have our own confidential registry. It was established in the early 80s by my predecessor, Dr. John Neal, um, who in fact, looking over death certificates, has actually found suspected cases of, of, of AIDS going back to 1976. So we'll just cover a few definitions here. Um, first, prevalence. Prevalence reflects the, the number of people living, currently living with HIV and AIDS uh, in our area. It includes those who do progress from AIDS over many years after their initial HIV diagnosis. Um, it is a cumulative measure and it does exclude deaths and it really reflects the burden of AIDS and HIV on our community services. Incidence refers to new diagnoses, and we have a bit of a novel de uh, definition. First, we have our new cases, or the initial report of HIV to our offices. But second, we call doorstep AIDS, a person who, who is tested for HIV, and within those, those next 12 months are actually diagnosed with AIDS. So in fact, these people have been walking around with HIV a long time, and they really are a population of interest for us. And we measure incidents on an annual measure. So now the data. Taking a look at prevalence for both um, our county and our community, um, clearly we're, we're reaching close to 6,000 people that we know of who have had um, the virus. About almost 2,000 that we know of from death certificate data have already died who are residents. Uh, currently, again, there are at least 3,700. And I say at least because the CDC does um, estimate that there are at least 25% more people who, who probably have HIV at this time. 72% of cases in our county um, are uh, Cleveland residents. And regardless of either county or Cleveland, about 57% 57 of cases uh, have been diagnosed with AIDS. Our prevalence rate here in Cleveland um, is 600 per 100,000, or about 0.6% of our population. Um, this is uh, about a 3% increase from last year. Uh, if we look at the county, um, we're, we're hitting about 0.3% and we're beginning to see more and more cases uh, who reside outside of Cleveland. And keep in mind too that prevalence does include those people who do transition you know, you know, naturally from having HIV and it's been recorded over several years to having AIDS. But in addition, we have a, a large migration 
of people who are HIV, who have been diagnosed elsewhere, who come here to Cleveland for um, to, to really be cared for by many of the centers of excellence here in the county. So we actually have an AIDS migration uh, here into the county. So if we look, if we compare our demographics of our population of HIV and AIDS, uh, Cleveland versus the U.S., in fact, our distribution is very similar in terms of age, in terms of sex, and even in terms of race and ethnicity, although we tend to have fewer uh, uh, Latinos who have HIV by proportion than the U.S. And that is primarily because in Cleveland, uh, based on census, 51% of our population is African American, about 7.3% are Latino or Hispanic. It's 2008, I imagine we probably have about 54 and maybe eight and a half, maybe even closer to nine. Um, I don't necessarily trust the American Community Survey. There are lots of people they miss, uh, certainly those who are institutionalized, those who are homeless. But certainly as our population decreases, and it has decreased about 7% since 2000, um, those numbers should change quite a bit uh, at our 2010 census. So in fact, Cleveland is, becomes a very good model for testing interventions, and we've been very fortunate to work with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention on several projects, including the Take Charge, Take the Test social campaign, which just, uh, just finished up uh, about a year ago. So now let's take a look at the distribution of those people who are living with HIV and AIDS within our community, and it covers the entire county. Um, the darker shades reflect higher prevalence. And you can see that we, we do have really a, a, a large area of those people with HIV and AIDS here on the west side from Ohio City, downtown Ohio City, Detroit Shoreway, Edgewater, rolling into Lakewood, extending out to Riverside. But also um, here in this crescent, which does reflect the majority of the African American population, in total we, we do have cases in nearly every municipality within the county. Our current race and ethnic distribution for HIV in Cleveland is about 59% African American. Keep in mind, again, that we have about 51% African American in our population and about 7% Hispanic or Latino. Um, the split of um, male-female is in fact uh, skewed towards females in our population. In many other cities it's upwards of 80 and 85 percent where the MSM, bisexual, or men who have sex with men and bisexual community tend to pr predominate the HIV and AIDS cases. And keep in mind too that we have a pretty substantial population of people, of males with HIV currently in Cleveland. It's almost reaching one percent. Among females, it's about 0.3 percent, so or a rate of 268 per 100,000. Now, this is a graphic that many of you who have seen this presentation have are, are familiar with. This is actually a trend map of the proportion of the number of um, HIV and AIDS incident cases that we report each year. In green, we actually have the total of those who are newly diagnosed with HIV or HIV only and those who are doorstep AIDS. And so I've split those, those two groups out in purple here, doorstep AIDS, which has decreased from 146 about 13 years ago down to only 36 cases. This is a really, this is a true success story for our outreach um, and, and for our community. However, the number of uh, those people coming in with HIV only has increased. It peaked at 115 last year. And in total, we actually have a 22% drop from 165 total cases down to 128. And this is in light of evidence that we have increased testing throughout Cleveland, both at our two uh, centers, the J. Glenn, uh, J. Glenn Smith Health Center and also our Thomas McCafferty Center for the city. But also we know um, we have uh, data from the, the free clinic as well that th their number, their testing numbers have, uh, have increased as well. So this is, a, this is a good sign. The message is getting out and fewer people are being tested positive in our community. 
And if we look uh, primarily at those new diagnoses, we have three clusters. A west side cluster here, uh, that includes our MSM, our bisexual Latino community, but also African Americans, and then pre predominantly an African American um, uh, representation here on the west side, or on the east side. And we use maps like this to really target our prevention efforts. So maps like these are, are critical to what we do at the health department. Now, um, one disturbing fact that, that we've been watching very closely is the, the increase in African Americans among our year-to-year -year numbers. Now, our numbers have dropped to 126 in terms of, terms of our new cases. But in fact, among African Americans, we've had a steady representation or proportion of our annual cases at about 60 to 65. This is the first time that we've ever broached 70%. And so perhaps this is uh, both a function of the smaller number of cases, but also more cases among this, the, this community. Among whites, it's stayed fairly the same, and also among Hispanics, and in fact, we're very glad to see that the number of Hispanics being diagnosed continue to drop. That story has a second part, though. Um, the number of African-American males that represent our annual numbers are up to almost 60% as well. So this is really a concern for our outreach, for the medical community to be aware that this is a population that we, we really have to pay much more attention to. Um, African American females has been um, limited to about 10 to 20 percent. White males has in fact gone down from over 20 percent now to about 15 percent on an annual basis. The third part of the story is age. We're beginning to see more and more African-American males who are young, younger, 20 to 29. This blue line actually shows the, the proportion on a year basis of the age breakdown of African-American males diagnosed on a year to year. So in fact, if we look at 1994, we can estimate that about 47% of all new diagnoses were age 30 to 39 at the time of diagnosis. That reflects you know, our, our, our perception of the, the primarily the MSM community at that time. But notice that that representation is, that proportion has gone down and now we're seeing more and more younger African American males. And in fact, we, we also see more older African American males as well. Now this graph is a little busy and I just want to walk you through it quickly. Um, we're looking at two years of incident cases of HIV and AIDS. Uh, in Cleveland, looking at all ages. And what I've done here is show you the breakdown of risk behavior among these males. 38% MSM, 19% heterosexual, any injection drug use, 14%, one in seven, bisexual, 10%, and then unknown, about 19 or 20%. Then on this axis, we, we actually break down the proportion for Hispanics, white non-Hispanics, and African-American non-Hispanics. And you can see that among MSMs, although our, full, our community has, um, among our new diagnoses, about 38% MSM, you can see that 63% of the, the white non-Hispanics are actually MSM. And 40% of the African Americans, or the total African Americans we diagnose um, the, of the males, are also MSM. Also interesting um, is the bisexual breakdown, 10% overall, but 17% among African Americans, 13% among Latinos, and 7% among white males. Finally, IDU, we're, we're really noticing that IDU is continuing to drop, however, um, it still is a problem among our Hispanic or Latino community, and it, and it continues to be both among males and females. Some more news, uh, a couple, about two years ago, we reported um, along, um, uh, along through the mayor's office, in fact, and also through Director, Cam uh, uh, Director Carroll, that we're beginning to see youth uh, between the ages of 13 and 19 being diagnosed with HIV. In 2004, 2005, our county actually had 19 cases. Um, in these past two years, we're up to 17 again, 14 of which were Cleveland cases. Now, the, the high proclivity, the high amount of STDs already in this population really, really gives us, you know, cause to worry. And it's one of the reasons why the mayor, uh, Mayor Jackson, um, County Health Commissioner Terry Allen, 
uh, Public Health Director Matt Carroll. Uh, the three of them really worked with the school system in Cleveland to get the, the comprehensive sexual health um, curriculum started. And, and this, was, this was really the motivating slide that got that started. If we extend the age range to about 13 to 24, um, notice that we have pretty much three clusters, um, many, much of which we're actually targeting in, in some of our funding efforts through uh, CDC and state money. Here on the west side near downtown, um, also this here extending even out to Warrensville Heights, Shaker Heights, Newburgh Heights, South Brooklyn area of Cleveland, and then the Glenville, um, Glenville Forest Hills, St. Clair, Superior area, and even into um, Huff as well, and then into Goodrich, Kirtland. So we've, uh, we use maps, again, maps like this again to really target our interventions. And, and this, people should keep this in mind, whether you're a parent, whether you're an educator, politician, or even citizen, that you know, you know, we, uh, we have to know where these people are, at least in terms of residents, so we can target our prevention efforts. Finally, the last part of the story are HIV and AIDS among people 50 and over. Now, as, our, as our, our treatments and therapies get better and better, people are living longer with, with HIV. However, we still do get people diagnosed beyond the age of 50 with, with HIV, de novo. And in fact, we've seen a 9% increase um, since 2001. One in six of our new diagnoses are age 50 and over. 22% or beyond one in four are in fact um, represent our, our new AIDS diagnoses. This is also pushing our prevalence, our cumulative numbers of those with uh, HIV and AIDS to where more than a third of persons living with AIDS are 50 and over. So this really puts an additional burden on our community uh, care sources. So finally, let's just summarize. Total incidence for 2007 has, has dropped 22% compared to 2006. Although we do have an increasing proportion of cases among African Americans, especially those young, uh, 20 to 29. We're also seeing an increased number of cases in youth, 13 to 19, about 70% of which are African American, but we do see white and Latinos, males and females. As I mentioned, older residents are acquiring HIV de novo or uh, progressing to AIDS over a long period of time. And finally, some good news. Um, our proportion of cases in the last year of, of IDU or injection drug use has dropped down to 4%. And this is remarkable because years ago it was up to 19%. Uh, and then recently 13%. So the word is, is hopefully is getting out to the Latino community and to others not to shoot up. And I think this is, I would, I, I would believe that this is a direct this is direct evidence of needle exchange, of the use and efficacy of needle exchange. And if we're seeing a drop in IDU and HIV, then we're seeing a drop most likely in hepatitis C. So this is very good news for the community. Um, finally, just to make, uh, make note, um, we do report on STDs for the county. And in fact, a report will be coming out later next week. Uh, with chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. And we just reported uh, about two months ago of a syphilis outbreak here in the county. And this syphilis outbreak is a serious issue. In Cleveland, our population um, of people who are turning positive are much different than, for example, Columbus, who have much higher rates. Our, the populations are, are both the MSM bisexual males and heterosexual males and females. And we're seeing a one-to-one -one ratio among males and females. So this is the real deal. And, and just this week, we had, a, I think, um, a 14-year-old. We've had 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds. We have a 14-year-old. We have a 16-year-old positive pregnant female. So already with high STD levels within that population, and now syphilis, we are really engaged at this problem. And in fact, we've re-engaged our disease intervention specialists, those people who go out and make contact tracing, who contact people who have HIV, who have syphilis, and their contacts are now primarily engaged in, in, in attacking this problem and secondarily in HIV. And this has been a project and efforts that we've, we've worked with both the county and state on. 
What we do at the health department primarily is in funding, uh, helping to fund agencies through CDC and state funding uh, for evidence-based interventions, especially at target populations. We do support service agencies and we have a large part in the regional advisory group who um, works directly with the community to get feedback and help us orient our programs and respond to their needs. We have testing at our clinics um, and especially STDs. We have many of our agencies whom we fund for HIV prevention coming to us and saying we want STD information as well. So we're being responsive to our community and very proactive in terms of our response to syphilis, many of whom have HIV on board as well. And then finally, we really co we try to coordinate our efforts in, a, in joint projects with the county and also with the state. Now I did hand out, or at least what was available to you, a fact sheet which has this information as well. Um, and thank you, Lorene. Um, we had a, a, some of them up front and um, also what we have uh, here today to give you. Um, this information again will be posted on clevelandhealth.info and uh, at this point I, I guess I could turn the uh, presentation over to Ron. Good afternoon, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to be talking about HIV prevention from um, that will probably in some new ways. Normally when people talk about HIV prevention, they talk about it from the point of view of, of risks at the level of the individual. So if you want to avoid HIV, you know, don't have high risk sex, don't share needles. And that's true, uh, but I think it's time for us to consider some of the other um, um, mechanisms and, and, and ways that we can look at HIV prevention to improve the efficacy of, of what we're doing out in our communities. Um, I'm, with, I, I, I'm of the school where you tell people what you're going to say and then you tell them and then you tell them what you told them. So let, I'll just let you know where I'm going to go with this. Um, I'm going to address three main questions. I'm going to emphasize the literature on, on, on gay men. Um, but the, the variables and, and the, the kinds of dynamics I'm talking about apply to most marginalized populations in our country. The first um, uh, question I want to answer is, is HIV prevention efficacious? Does it have effects? Is it working among gay men? Um, the second question is, how can, are they working actually out in the real world? And the third question is, how can efforts be made even more effective? So these are the three things I'm going to talk about, focusing on the data with gay men. On the first question, does HIV prevention work, that's an easy one to answer. Uh, Jeff Herbst and, and another group at the Centers for Disease Control did a very fancy statistical analysis which is called a meta-analysis. So it's in a way of quantitatively summarizing a, a, an entire literature on HIV. So they went back with a group of librarians and went through um, something on the order of 10,000 articles on HIV. They had to read all that stuff, the poor guys, and to identify the randomized control trials that were designed to test the effects of, of HIV prevention. These are the same trials you use to test new drugs, drug development with HIV and other drugs. Um, and, and what they were able to report are, are impressive from the entire literature, the effective trials and the trials that didn't work, the entire literature, um, significant and important reductions in risk, about a quarter reduction in unprotected anal sex, 15% decrease in sex partners, and a 61% and increase in, in protected sex among, among MSM. Um, the interventions, they also were able to look at the qualities of the interventions that worked better. So the interventions that worked better were theory based. They worked better if the intervention had a plan, in other words, and, and a plan that made sense. Um, the interventions worked better if there were group discussions, um, multiple sessions. So talking to people multiple times gets better results. Interpersonal skill building. So it's not just a matter of HIV is going to get you if you don't look out. It's how do you talk your partner into being safe or how, how can you talk your partners into, into using condoms every time you have sex and, and greater intervention expo exposure. So these are the qualities that have interventions that have better effect sizes among, among gay men. So HIV interventions can work if they are well funded and well fielded. So this stuff can work. Does it work? 
Um, to answer the question of whether HIV prevention is working, um, I've done led a group where we did an, a similar thing to the meta-analysis, but we did a, a literature review looking at all of the papers uh, from 1995 to the present, looking at incidence of HIV. Incidence is a, is a quantity, it's a rate, and it's a measure of the rate of new infections. So when people talk about prevalence of a disease, that's a measure of how big the monster is. Incidence is how fast is it moving. Okay, so we looked at all of the incidence rates um, in the in entire um, literature. The reason we did this, of all the literature, is that many, um, when you report that San Francisco has an incidence rate of 2.6%, what does that say about Cleveland? So any one city, um, it's, it's difficult to know if it's representative of, of, of the country or, or a larger group. Also, many, many studies are done by following groups of, of men or, or other populations over time, and as part of the human subjects um, procedures for following a cohort like that, you have to do safe sex education. And bringing people in every six months for, um, you know, to blood draws and what have you been up to and here's the safe sex intervention, all that, probably means that the folks who stay in the cohort and don't leave are going to reduce their risk as a result of having been in the cohort itself. So that we wanted to look at many different ways of measuring instance, the STARS assay um, and, and also the cohort studies and so on, putting all this together to get a sense of what was going on in the United States as an overall estimate of incidence. Um, so we did a lot of, of the standard things that you do in an instance re, uh, in these kinds of reviews. They're in the slides that have been handed out. Um, we had, it turned out also that instance rates are different depending on how you get your samples. So if you're getting your sample from folks who are showing up for STD treating, guess what? They're riskier. But samples that are drawn from the community itself are going to be far less risky. So we, so we stratified our analysis by whether the samples, the instance came in rates were generated from community-based samples, HIV test site samples, folks who know they've been risky and they wanted to find out whether they've been infected, and STD clinic samples. Um, first off, it's interesting to note that HIV instance rates vary by continent. So in Australia, the rates are about 1% a year. So 1% of MSM in Australia get infected every year, newly infected a year. North America and Europe are about the same. And that also, instance rates did not rise or decline from 95 to 2005. On the community-based sample side, the rate was 2.4%. HIV test sites, about 2.5. And HIV test treatment samples, about 3.8. Very high rates of new infections. Now one of the things, and one of the reasons we did this review is it's been bothering me for a long, long time that when we talk about instance rates, everybody asks the questions, well, are the rates going up or down? But nobody asks, well, what does 2.4 percent mean? It sounds pretty good. I mean, I wish I could get a mortgage rate at 2.4 percent, right? So what does 2.4 percent mean over the long haul, and what does 2.4 percent mean in terms of our ability to fight the AIDS epidemic among gay men? Um, so just as a thought experiment, I, I, we, we created an imaginary cohort of gay men aged 18, none of whom were infected, and followed them uh, to the age of 60. We assumed no mortality due to HIV. So all these guys, even if they get infected, live to age of 60. And we assumed the identical mortality that men in the general population would have. So car accidents, gun violence, um, car, car wrecks, all cancer, all that stuff, which basically amounts to very few guys before the age of 50. And so basically, uh, assuming the same mortality in a cohort of men as men in, the, in, in, in general and at an instance rate of 2.4 percent, what, what would the burden of disease due to HIV be over time? Well, this line describes it, and the, the little dotted lines are the confidence intervals around our estimate. So that at, at, if, assuming 2.4 percent of these guys get infected every year, by age 25, about 17 percent of the men um, would be HIV positive. So these are, this is 10 percent, 20 percent, 30 and so on. So at age 25, about 17 percent of these guys would be infected. By age 30, about 25 percent would be infected. By age 35, about a third. And by age 40, a little over 40 percent. 
So this 2.4% instance rate that we're talking about and that we're seeing all over the country is not good news. If 40% under these instance conditions get infected by age 40, we're in trouble. The other thing that's important to remember is, is that when the AIDS epidemic started in 1984, I happened to be helping out in San Francisco with the first population-based sample of, of gay men called the San Francisco Men's Health Study. In 1984, before any HIV prevention had ever been done, on intake, 48% of the men in that sample were infected. So I guess we're doing a little bit better now, and oh, and the mean age in that sample was 40. So I guess we're doing a little bit better now. 40% is, 42% is better than 48, but I don't feel very good about that as, as, a, as a success story. The other thing I wanted to point out is what's going on with our African American MSM. What's going on with African American gay men? There are two instance estimates published by the Centers for Disease Control on instance rates on black gay men. The first rate is 4%, the other rate is so obscene I can hardly repeat it. We use the more conservative 4% rate. So you, under the same assumptions as we did for MSM in general, this purple line describes what's going on with our African American men. Assuming a 4% rate of infection with no, all negative at age 18, by age 25, about a quarter of the men would already be infected. By age 30, almost 40%. By age 35, about half. And by age 40, almost 60%. These rates are atrocious and are as bad, worse, than most of the data that we're seeing out of Sub-Saharan Africa. I'll get back to what the real data say in a minute. We were naturally pretty horrified by our extrapolation, our thought experiment, that there must be something wrong. So I went back to CDC data looking at the community-based surveys that they did reporting where they actually tested men. Um, very large samples in, um, let's see, five American cities. Uh, there were about 3,000 guys in the sample, if I remember, so these are big numbers. These are the rates of HIV infection that the CDC reported by their age grades. So from 20 to 25, about 14% of these guys were infected. And these green bars here are confidence intervals. So basically, our extrapolation up to the age of 25 is working. From 25 to 30, the CDC reported about 17% of the men were infected. About halfway through here, we, we estimated around 20%. These are the confidence intervals for the CDC estimates. These are the confidence intervals for ours. They're the same, statistically speaking. From 30 to 40, um, the Centers for Disease Control reported the prevalence of HIV infection was about 29%. Um, and at the midpoint on ours, we thought it was about a third. Again, the confidence intervals overlap. So while our, conf while our extrapolation is just a thought experiment and, and you know, there are many, many things you could, you could argue with about the way we did it, as a general rule of thumb, we're in the ballpark of what people are seeing in the real world. So this extrapolation that we're talking about is not something that may happen one day or might happen sometime in the future. This is something that is happening within MSM populations right now, even as we speak. The epidemic is being reproduced with very high prevalence rates across generations of gay men. This is particularly the case with African American MSM. So to get back to my original question, is HIV prevention working out in the real world in the United States? I think about the most polite thing that I can say about this is not as well as anybody would like. So what are we going to do about it? Um, what I'd like to do now are make some suggestions about how we could maybe improve our practice and, and, and how can we make things better among gay male populations and think about whether any of these variables would also work for other populations of people in this room with whom you're working. First off, with HIV prevention, uh, what's going on with gay men anyway, and this may be true in other communities, is nobody knows what risky sex is anymore. Is positive on positive sex risky? What happens if you have an undetectable viral load? Can you transmit virus? The Swiss say no. Um, they, don't, don't try that at home. Um, <laughs> negotiated safety. If you, know, if, you, if you both are negative, 
and you both get tested and you both agree not to have sex with anybody else or not to have risky sex with anybody else, does that protect you? No. Doesn't work with women in Africa, I'll tell you that. And, and so do you, and you want to lay, do you want to lay your chances of being negative on choices somebody else is making when you're not around? Um, and so these are all kinds of um, um, PrEP and, pa and PrEP and PAP is post-exposure prophylaxis and pre-exposure prophylaxis and so on. So these are all informational strategies that gay men are struggling with and nobody, there are no epidemiological data out there to basically tell us whether or not these things really work or not on a population basis. Next, which information matters? Public health campaigns tend to focus on, you know, high risk sex, shooting drugs and all that stuff, but maybe a smarter way to go would be to talk about when do you mostly have risks? What are the situations, the context under which you're most likely to be risky and how are you going to avoid those contexts or what are you going to do about those situations if you're ever in them again? If you get, if your risks happen when you go out once every four months and have too much to drink, well maybe on those nights you'd better make sure that you have some condoms on you those kinds of, of, of skill sets and, and anticipation of when you're most likely to be risky. Um, in terms of motivations, one thing that's been really interesting in terms of prevention with positives is a variable that shows up over and over again are two things, a sense of responsibility and a sense of altruism. It's about values. And so what, who has responsibility for high risk sex? Who has responsibility for being safe? Um, and, and, and there's a split, there's a divide among gay men. Negative men think it's the, it's the responsibility of positive men to disclose and be safe. After all, they've got the virus. A lot of positive men will tell you, wait, you're the person who could get hurt. You're the one who should take responsibility for this. So we have two sides of a big divide, both of whom think the other people are the ones who are supposed to be in charge of things. And what you end up is no one owning it, which is a recipe for disaster. Um, one of the things that I've been very interested in in my research is looking at the effects of multiple epidemics on HIV risk taking and I was part of a group that took a very large household based sample of gay men in four large cities, about 3,000 guys and as we I answered the questions and one of the things we wanted to do was to look at the, uh, what was going on with other health issues with gay men. So we looked at across the board in terms of access to health care, mental health problems, substance abuse, violence victimization, on and on and on. And as we were doing these analyses on these surveys, or the analyses of the data from our work, one of the things that struck me as, as I was helping people do these analyses was how much everything was related to everything else. And I got more and more interested in that, and so I did a really kind of a, a simple little analysis. These, re, these are numbers, these numbers are odds ratios. And so what this means is, and I'll explain in a second this, all the statistical language, but these are adjusted odds ratios controlling for a lot of things that we know are associated um, with um, sexual risk taking. Oh, with HIV, um, with HIV rather. And what I did was I wanted to see the extent controlling for all these variables that all these four epidemics, substance abuse, depression, and partner violence, and childhood sexual abuse were interrelated. So controlling for all of the, controlling for all these things, the men with substance abuse were about twice as likely to have partner violence, have current partner violence, a partner with whom, you know, that they get beat up by, and about one and a half times more likely to be depressed. Men who were depressed were about twice as likely to be survivors of childhood sexual abuse, about one and a half times more likely to have current partner violence in their lives, and about one and a half times more likely to be substance abusers. Men who have partner violence were about twice as likely to be survivors of childhood sexual abuse, one and a half times more likely to be depressed, about twice as likely uh, to be substance abuser. What this table says is that there are at least four different epidemics in the MSM community which are intertwining and making each other worse. This is called a syndemic in medical language. There's actually a web page at the Centers for Disease Control. If you type in syndemic, they actually, t uh, syndemics occur in many, many populations. So what has this got to do with HIV? I did a very simple thing. Oops, I lost my, oh well. Um, of looking at the, um, the, the relationship between number of epidemics for which these guys scored positively 
and their probability of having high risk sex and being HIV positive. So there were four epidemics I looked at. Logically, the men could have none of the epidemics, one, two, three, or four. And what you can see here is that there's a dose effect. So that the, one, the men with none of the epidemics had seven, percent were more likely to, were likely seven percent had high risk sex, one had eleven, two had sixteen, and, and by the time you got to three or four, about twenty-three um, percent were had recent high risk sex. So what you've got are these backgrounds of intertwining psychosocial health conditions, depression, violence, childhood sexual abuse, inter um, substance abuse that are driving HIV risk taking and HIV infection itself. Now you notice at the high end of this, the numbers went down in terms of HIV seroprevalence, but can you imagine living with HIV and having three or four of those epidemics over the long haul? And by the time we had done this survey, already about 100,000 gay men had already died of HIV infection in this country, and I think the excess mortality was at the end, which is why those numbers are, went down at the high end. So that it's not just risk taking and it's not just HIV. They're interconnected epidemics that are driving risk among gay men. And I've, I've in some of my work later, I've, I've been working on um, a uh, theory of syndemic production, which is about um, violence and homophobia, and violence and homophobic attacks that start at a very early age as a developmental process, which is a whole other talk and I can't get into now. But just think about how this would apply to other populations. Like, excuse me, do, sub, do injection drug users have high rates of violence, drug abuse, childhood sexual abuse, and partner violence? Gee, I wonder. And could any of those things be driving and making the epidemic work in, worse in injection drug using populations? Now I want to talk about viral load for a minute and community viral load. Viral load is an interesting thing because now in the post-protease era we have ways of treating HIV. And we also know now with some research, with ongoing research that's being done, is that untreated HIV seropositive people are, are, have higher viral loads, as we all know, but they're more efficient transmitters of HIV infection. So that it, so that, it, that raises the possibility that if you live in a, in a population with a higher rate of people who don't know they're positive and are not getting treated, or they know they're positive but don't have access to medical care, that that population has a higher community viral load. And maybe in those populations you'd, have, you'd be at greater risk. Let's walk through that for a minute. How, what do I mean by that? Let's say you're living in a population where you have equal prevalence rates of HIV infection, one out of four are infected, but in population A, all of them are in antiretroviral care, and the community viral load is only the people who are newly infected. So the community viral load there would be a very few people who aren't getting treated or they're newly infected and don't know they're positive. Let's say in that population the rate, the community viral load rate is 5%. Let's say you have another community that does not have access to medical care and that they don't, um, and, and they, they either can't get care or they don't trust the medical care system to treat them well or they're alienated from the medical care system. So in that rate, one in four are infected, but almost all of them are staying out of the health care system because they can't get access. They don't have medical insurance or they don't trust the medical care system. And so out of that 25% that are infected, 20% the community viral load in that community is 20%. So in community A, the viral load, the proportion of viremic, the community viral load in community A is 5%, and the, pro, and the community viral load in community B is 20%. Let's say that, person, that you're the same person that has high-risk sex once or twice a year. Are you more likely to get infected in community A, where there's a 5% viral load, or community B, where there's a 20% viral load? B. So it's not about your risk, it's about the community in which you live and the context in which you live and whether or not your community has access to medical care. So what has that got to do with the real world? Um, these are slides from my friend and colleague, Greg Millette, and I'm going to report instance rates here for African American MSM. Remember my extrapolation? With the, out, with the uh, unspeakable rates of HIV infection among our African American uh, MSM citizens. These are rates of HIV infection as reported by the Centers for Disease Control. So already by age 22, 15% of these men are already infected. 
and from 23 to 29, a third already. These are in line with the horrific extrapolations that I, that I presented. These are rates of prevalence rates of African American MSM compared to Latinos and whites. So 14% of these guys were infected in age 18 to 22. The white rate was 3%. So you're talking a fourfold increase right here, right? In incidence rates, the incidence rates number, this is the 4% rate I used. These are the incidence rates for other ethnicities. Age 29, look at the incidence rate here. Almost 15%. We did not use this incidence rate, and so far as I'm aware, this is the highest rate of HIV incidence that's ever been reported for any population anywhere in the world. So, outlandish rates of HIV infection among, among African American MSM, right? These guys must be having lots of sex, right? And they must be shooting lots of drugs because they are sure getting infected. Greg Millett at Centers for Disease Control did an analysis of, of about 200 papers of which we hel I helped him on this, and guess what? That isn't so. If anything, African American MSM are less risky than white guys. It's the white guys that should have rates like this, not the African American guys. Well, let me ask if so, we, we, there is no evidence in the behavioral literature to suggest that African American MSM have in, higher rates that could even begin to explain these heavy duty prevalence rates or incidence rates. And now our question at the Centers for Disease Control was, well, if, if you can't explain where all this HIV is coming from, how are you supposed to do HIV prevention? So Greg kept on with his analysis to look at what was driving it. He, interestingly enough, he found a paper that was published by uh, Mike Samuels and Warren Winkelstein out for the San Francisco Men's Health Study back in 1987, 20 years ago. These guys reported much higher rates among black gay men and said that it could not be explained by risk-taking behavior. They published, they hid this paper in an out of way journal called the Journal of the American Medical Society Association. <laughs> And it's it you know and and the whole field just ha didn't take it as seriously as it should. Greg wanted to take him up to figure it out. So these are the variables that Greg identified. We sat down and identified every single variable we could think of that would explain these higher rates. It's not sexual risk taking. It's not self disclosure of being gay, and it is definitely not substance abuse. It is possible and even probable that untreated HIV infection and STDs, contributors to community viral load, um, contribute to the higher rates of HIV infection, and these are the variables that we could not um, sort out whether or not these had an effect or not. Um, and so, which HIV adherence, incarceration, maybe jails have something to do with it, sexual networks, sex with known positive partners, access to health care, circumcision, and biology or genetics, the CCR5 thing. Um, but basically what it comes down to is we cannot explain these very higher rates um, based on, on the usual variables that explain HIV infection in MSM populations. And so Greg did a meta-analysis, went back and did a secondary meta-analysis, and at the end of the quantitative meta-analysis, um, these are the four variables that seem to be able to explain higher rates of HIV infection. I made the, um, off of Greg's slides, um, the yellow variables here are all predictors of higher viral load, higher community viral load, so that it looks like lower rates of access to medical care, lower rates of insurance, among our African American fellow citizens, higher rates of STD, also a measure of lack of medical care, and low antiretroviral use, even among people who know they're positive, are explaining the higher rates of HIV transmission among African American MSM. It's not their individual risk, it's the context in which they're living. Um, next is prevention practice, efficacy into effectiveness. We have all these interventions that reduce risk by a third among gay men and increase consistent condom use by 60%, but they're not out there being fielded. And, and the, the programs that are out there, it's, it's enormously difficult to get them reproduced in ways that are faithful to the originalized, very well-funded NIH and CDC-funded randomized trials. And so there's a whole school of trying to be able to take the translation of this um, high science into community health practice. And that translation is a lot harder to translate out into the field than you might think from reading you know, things like the American Journal of Public Health. The other thing that we have to think about is what I'm calling the prevention um, 
um, um, you know, what, what resources exist. I mean, you know, the government is not anxious to fund this kind of stuff. They're spending $500 million a year on abstinence-only education, and we've recently seen the um, efficacy of that on a, on a very high-level stage, um, of, uh, <laughs> but we can't go there. Um, but, you know, it, if that money were put into programs that actually work for teenagers and, and MSM, we'd be a lot better off than we are now, and underfunding um, HIV prevention is a, is a huge issue. Um, also, prevention practice in terms of ultimately where we're trying to go is safe sex over long periods of time. All of our prevention trials only go out a year. Nobody knows how to um, in, you know, support safe sex practice over a lifetime, over decades of life, which is a big piece of what's going on with MSM communities and, and, and increased risk. So in turn, to summarize all this, a lot of questions gay men are asking are what specifically is risk? How safe do I want to be? What about my take on things? How do I maintain safe sex for decades on end? What can I do about coexisting conditions that influence my risk, the syndemic phenomena? What, do I, what am I supposed to do about community viral load? How do, how do I know how to handle that when I know that 50 percent, as is the case of many samples of African American and MSM are already infected, two thirds of them don't even know it. What are you supposed to do in a situation like that? And how do I maintain safety when I'm under constant homophobic attacks? Now notice that we can cluster these things into a whole series of different variables. So knowledge and self-knowledge would be about the level of the individual. Interpersonal would be the responsibility thing. Community, you can link the community norms, norms about safety, um, violent racist attacks if you're a member of a, my, of a, of a, of a, of a marginalized community, um, syndemic conditions. Community viral loads, endemic conditions, and translational work could be about public health infrastructure and government policy. Access to medical care so that you could actually do something about community viral load. And leadership to support health initiatives in your own community. So notice that these things can be clumped according to a whole bunch of variables. Which ones are we spending the most time on in HIV prevention? And where are we spending all our money? Individual. And as you go up the queue, less and less money and less and less energy is getting, is getting spent on this. So my question is this. Let's think about HIV treatment. When we were trying to do HIV treatment, we realized in the treatment of HIV infection that when you only used one strategy, you got significant results, but they went away in two months. And the way that we made HIV, prevention, HIV treatment work was we used multiple mechanisms of treatment efficacy, the triple cocktails, the cocktail approach. So multiple mechanisms of treatment efficacy meant that we could stop the reproduction, basically, of HIV in a person and keep them healthy. Well, what would happen if we started thinking about a prevention cocktail where instead of putting all of our money and all of our level energy at the level of the individual, which isn't even driving risk in some communities, and start thinking about a cocktail approach where we would look at multiple mechanisms of prevention activity to do community health at a broader level so that individuals could also, you would do this stuff at the level of the individual, but you would also add some other kinds of, of things that would help to do the, to, to, that help these efforts and make a, a cocktail approach to prevention. So you would keep the interventions that we know work at the level of the individual, but you would also do epidemiological research to answer the questions of what really is risky in your community. You would, you would work a lot on lowering community viral load by making health care accessible to HIV positive people, finding HIV positive people, letting them know that they can get into care, and by lowering the rate of community viral load, even if human beings, and I'm one, make a mistake over the course of a year, it, their probability of being infected with HIV is far lower because they're making that mistake within a community that has a low community viral load. You would, um, and so you would have at-risk um, for all at-risk populations, but included in this would be access for the comorbid conditions. There should not be waiting lists for HIV positive people to get into substance abuse treatment or HIV negative people to get into substance abuse treatment. You, there should be treatment for depression and other mental health conditions that we know are associated with, with HIV risk. Our, our communities should be safer and, and, and women and men 
should feel like they have some recourse when they're in a relationship when they're getting beaten up. If you're in a relationship where your partner's beating you up, you probably don't have a lot of choice about whether or not you have safe sex with that person. So that all of these things are part of raising not only the health profile, but also lowering the community viral load. And finally, a supportive policy environment where marginalized communities aren't, aren't treated like second-class citizens, they're treated like they have a right to stay alive and a right to stay healthy. So conclusions, HIV incidence rates among MSM populations cluster in the 2% range uh, um, and, and have been the same um, for, for at least 10 years. That's, I guess, good news. The incidence rates were far higher back before HIV had been discovered. However, ongoing incidence rates at this level will yield very high rates of HIV infection with each new generation of gay men. We're just treading water with gay male populations in terms of the efficacy of prevention. We have strong evidence to show that model HIV prevention programs in randomized control trials work. They reduce risk. We have far less evidence to show that these, that these model programs have been translated into communities across our country and even less evidence to show that they've been reproduced in communities where the risk is the greatest. Where is the randomized control trial that has efficacious data to show that prevention works among African American MSM? There isn't one. Where's the one to show that it works for substance abuse in gay men? There isn't one. So this kind of work just has to be done. Um, we know what works in terms of intervention, but a uh, few of these intervention qualities and the things that we know work are actually addressing the questions that gay men are struggling with in the third decade of the epidemic. So, what are we going to do about it? I think we absolutely have to think about how would we tap multiple mechanisms of prevention efficacy so that each effort that we're doing becomes more efficacious than one alone. We can't treat HIV infection with, with you know, single therapy um, treatments. We cannot do effective HIV prevention when we're only looking at one mechanism of, of intervention um, efficacy. So we need to test how we would roll these programs out and show that they work better than the, than the single mechanism programs that we're doing now. Um, now a lot of people, like, you know, I feel kind of naive saying this, like, well, let's just get, you know, nationalized health care and, and let's, let's get rid of racism and violence and, and, and figure out effective ways to treat substance abuse and all this stuff. And a lot of people, when I look at this, you know, I've had people say, Ron, that's, you know, it, your argument kind of holds water, but like, uh, excuse me, how exactly would you do that? And, and how would you make it work? You know what, they're right, this is a big challenge. And, but that does not mean that we turn our back on, on, on being able to actually do good prevention ac activities at the community level. And why do I know that so? Because remember when I did the rollout of the different um, continents of, of rates of HIV infection? This is the rate among Americans in general. These are the horrific extrapolations for our African American MSM fellow citizens. But you know what this line is? This is the line that you have for Australia. Their 1% rate of HIV <coughs> infection. So that by age 30, only about 12% of MSM under the 1% rate in, in Australia would be HIV positive. And by age 40, the rate of HIV infection would be half what it is in the United States. Now, I don't know what they're doing in Australia. That, well, actually, I know a lot about it. But, like, but I mean, you know what? They're, they're doing some things that make sense. Right? And we can learn a lot from them. But what, this, what the main point is, is that it is possible to do multiple things that would make, that we can do better, is the point of this. And the Australians have already shown us that they are. So I think we can learn from the Australians, we can come up with some answers that are American answers for our own situation, and that, and that we can bring these horrific rates of HIV infection down across generations of gay men by being smarter and using our resources better and thinking through multiple mechanisms of prevention activity. So that's my message and that's what I wanted to say and I hope this made some sense.